Good morning. I'm so happy to be here. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and also a few new faces. Um, I don't live too far from here, maybe about 30 minutes from here. And my ministry, as uh, you have been praying for us, uh, is in South San Jose. Uh, specifically, it's called the uh, Seven Trees Community. So before I begin, I really thank you so much for uh, keeping us, myself, my family, and also the uh, the Guiding Light Project ministry in your prayers as you continually uh, lift us up to the Lord. So we, we on behalf of GLP, I thank you so much for uh, being our prayer support as well as um, a ministry uh, partners. Uh, shall we go to the Word? Um, our passage today, I would like to share is from Romans chapter 10 verses 10 through 16 if I may yes I'm going to turn around I'm sorry uh, because I have a different version here so let's read this together if we may Ready, go. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in Him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Amen. Amen. During one of the worships, I asked this question to the congregation, and there were young kids as well as grown-ups uh, like us. And the question is this, who are you? Have you ever asked this question, who are you? Maybe you are meeting somebody for the first time and they ask you, who are you? Right? But I asked this question uh, during the worship setting, who are you? And I got uh, responses that were different from younger kids. They gave me their names. I am Michael. You know me. I am, I am Julia. I am so-and-so. I'm a boy. I'm a girl. But how would you answer? Some of the adults, they said, I'm an engineer. I'm a doctor. I'm a uh, stay-at-home mom. And this, this question is becoming more and more convoluted as we live. Uh, the reason is because the laws of this land is, is being more complicated and is going away from the Bible. Uh, I, I believe 2016, state of New York, they passed a law uh, just on gender issue, uh, now they can choose one of 36. They actually passed a law saying that they, a person can choose to be one of 36 genders. I believe that's a number. Uh, or if I may be off by one or two. But how can a person be one of 36? I don't even know what you know the minority things are. There is obviously... Uh, male, female, and there's transgenders, and there's all this. So a simple question, uh, which is, who are you, could, be, could bring much complication in, uh, in one's identity. And I wanted to actually share with you uh, today about two things. Our identity, according to the Bible. How would you understand it for yourself? And as parents, how are we to teach our kids as they live in ever-changing society that we are currently living in? And also, what are the, uh, then the responsibility or the duty of Christians? Right? 
I believe the right answer is, uh, is from the Bible. When we are asked, who are you? For the folks who have Christ in them, we are what? A child of God. It's as simple as that. We are a children. We're children of God, according to what the Bible says. And Bible is the truth that teaches us, and it never changes. And if we uh, look to the the law of the land, then we are at a loss because law of the land changes every so often, as people choose to accept what what the the trending. I guess issue is that favors a specific uh, group. So, who are you is what I wanted to start with. Who are you? Christians are those who are blessed, who have shown grace from the Lord. That separates us from the people who do not believe in Christ Jesus. And what does it mean to be graced? It means that our sins are forgiven, right? It means this grace, this blessing from the Lord cannot be mimicked by any human being. We are forgiven of what? Of our sins, both past, present, and in the future. Something that we can never manage on our own. Because we simply cannot. We are born from sin. We, we tend, we are... We are pulled to sin, and we are susceptible to sin every day. And yet God who loves us, and He showed His love for us in this way, that He sent His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, so that He could die on the cross for our sins, once and for all. So that when we are forgiven, uh, we are not only forgiven, but there is also uh, an after blessing. Which is what? To live for the future. For the eternity. I think that uh, really hit me this past week. I just came back from uh, Korea uh, yesterday. And I woke up this morning at 2.30 because I'm still in Korea time. Uh, but what I did was I actually uh, went and got the... Uh, got some medical checkups, uh, specifically endoscopy to look at my stomach as well as a colonoscopy, right? So you know what that is. And I did it because uh, I have a family history where my dad passed away from stomach cancer at his young age. So I knew that uh, I may be susceptible to such illness. So as a preventive measure, um, I went with my family and I, I I went into the hospital and then they gave me the, the shot to kind of sedate me and I only remember uh, giving them my birthday. And then afterwards I woke up and they gave me the news. Well, um, your case is a bit more serious. So we have to refer you to the specialist. Up until this time, I thought I'm pretty healthy because I don't get sick often. I look at myself and I, I deem it as I'm healthy. People look at me and say, man, you look healthy. So, you know, by definition, I thought I was healthy. But the news that broke from the, the doctor says, you don't seem healthy inside. So I went to the specialist and they gave me another exam. And then... He told me that I needed to be hospitalized for one day. Such a big news and, and it actually uh, scared me because um, I would have never thought, you know, I would have, I, I thought that I would, you know, pass with flying colors and yet uh, the opposite of what I had hoped was unfolding right in front of my eyes. But it gave me a time to reflect. Reflect on, uh, as I was, you know, laying on that bed, um, how have I lived my life? I'm in my mid-40s, and when I was in my 20s, I was looking forward to what I was going to be in my 30s. So I was excited about times to come. But in my 40s, uh, those things uh, have changed from what is waiting for me, 
to what have I done so far? I don't know whether you've actually have uh, had a moment to think about what life have you led? But also gave me a, a, a moment to think about and appreciate God's blessings for me. Because whatever came out as the result, I was okay. Because I know that if God gave, you know, gives me a certain date on this earth, that there is eternity waiting for me. Do you ever think about eternity? It's somewhat difficult, I think, living in Silicon Valley because we lead such busy life. Family is demanding, work is even more demanding perhaps. But as Christians, as children of God, we have to reflect that we're not just living on this earth to be pros prosperous here, to chase after success. But we're living on this earth as a stepping stone for the eternity where we will be with our Lord who made us. And I wonder, as I was laying on that hospital bed, uh, what it will be. How will I react when I see Jesus? How will I behave in God's presence? Right? Because to come to church and to know Christ is to have the hope for the eternity. We have to lead a spiritual life. And not just what we see with our naked eyes and how we interpret the world around us. But there's more to it than that. And perhaps the spiritual life is what we need to focus our daily decisions on. Because the Bible encourages us, encourages us to live a life which is a life that is saved. There is a clear difference between the life that is saved and between the life that is not saved. And I don't know which life we are leading right now at this moment. But I hope that by the end of today's worship that we make a decision. Decision that is right with me and that is right in God's eyes. The blessings that God gave us is salvation. When we believe Jesus Christ in our heart and profess with our mouth. Just like how Peter professed, right, when he, when he was asked by Jesus, Who do you say I am? Jesus said, You are the Messiah, you are the Christ, Son of the living God. And he was commended by Jesus. Well done. And upon your name I will build church. And that is a life that we need to uh, lead and that is our identity. Shall we say a silly yet meaningful exercise? Let's put our hands over our head. And then repeat after me, please. <laughs> when, I, when I do this with kids, they love it. <laughs> when I do it with parents, they say, uh, it's kind of awkward. I don't want to mess up my hair. <laughs> but say, I'm a child of God. God created me. In His image, in the image of God, for His purpose. Yes, that is according to Genesis. That we are born on this earth with the purpose. We're not just here by chance. But we are here with a specific purpose. And the purpose is to bring out Christ who is in us to the world around us. That's the identity that we have to accept, make it our own. That I don't live my life as I wish, but I choose my life to reflect God's love, which is in me. Then, 
we cannot just live our life according to our selfish ways. But we have to think twice about what brings glory to, what brings honor to God's name. Because ultimately, that's how Jesus lived, right? He did not uh, do anything out of his own. He always followed the will of God. And as Christians, if we consider ourselves as Christ followers, we have to mimic the ways that Jesus lived, which is to follow how God wants us to live. So then, once we know what our identity is, then there are certain ways or the duty or the responsibility uh, that is called upon us, right? And Jesus actually clearly uh, states it in the Gospel books. First is what? To love the Lord with all our hearts and also to love one another. That's the greatest commandment and then the greatest commission comes in where Jesus sends out the twelve and tells them to go to the ends of the world, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit so that they could also become the followers of Christ. So we have this, uh, this lifestyle that we need to live, which is to worship God and have Him known in our life. It calls for a spiritual walk. It calls us to pray to the Lord. It calls us to love one another, even though there may be conflicts. There are ways that we need to manage. That way is to adopt humility in our life. It's very difficult. And just because we are older, I don't think it makes it any easier. Right? I see it in my two children. I have two kids, uh, 12 and 10, uh, girl and boy. And they go to Christian school, their dad is a pastor, and I stress this all the time. But conflicts come about. He says, she said, you know, they point fingers. And then sometimes I have to be the mediator and say, you know? And then they say, Dad, you always argue with mom. <laughs> and, and, and they just, you know, stop me from adding anything more because they're right. And it brings me, brings me back to uh, where I need to be, where I need to ask God, God, give me humility, teach me how to humble myself so that I can impact others so that their faith may grow in you. As Christians, we don't just want to humble ourselves, but our humility needs to lead for the people around us so that their faith can grow. That's, I think, our purpose of being humble, because that's what Jesus did, right? He lowered himself so that his followers would grow in faith as they trust and in the world, there are many humble people. But they do not always reflect edifying others. They just are searching for their own righteousness. We cannot be self-righteous because of our sinful nature. That's why Jesus came to us and through Him we are called righteous. And that's the grace of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has shown us. So then, what I would like to do is to, if you can, uh, turn on the yeah, PowerPoint. So if you can see the, the bubbles, the blue bubbles, um, that actually you know, summarizes the, the passage today. The flow of how one receives or is exposed to the gospel message, right? There has to be a sender of the gospel message. Who is the sender? Sender here is always God himself. Because for God so loved the world, for God so loved myself and all of us here today. And then there was a messenger, 
In the Old Testament, these were the prophets. In the New Testament, it was Jesus Christ himself and when he went to heaven, and it was his followers, right? And if we remember our own uh, past about how we became Christians, there was always uh, perhaps one or more messengers from the Lord sharing the good news with us. And then we were once listeners, right? Before we knew Christ, we were the listeners. And then some people believed in Him. So they become believers. And some choose not to believe. In this uh, passage where Paul is talking to the Jews, they listened because Jesus Himself declared and spoke to them plainly. But they refused to listen. I don't know where you stand. Have you listened, believed in your heart that Jesus is the Lord and Savior? And that you became a believer? Because if we are a believer, then the benefit is eternity in heaven. And also living in God's presence on this earth. But some will not choose to believe. Why? Because they choose not to surrender. You know, in the Gospel messages, there's a story of a young Jewish wealthy man. Right? Young man comes to Jesus and asks him a question. Lord, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? What must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus answers him, you have to Obey all the commands, all the laws. And young man proudly said, yes, I have done all those things. And then Jesus said, you did well. There is one more thing that you have to do. You have to sell all your possessions, give to the poor, and follow me. And the young man was troubled. Because he did not want to go as far as where Jesus asked him. Jesus is asking for our surrender of our rights. Why? Because He has bigger things to give to us. He has bigger meaning in our life for us to live out. And when we said, Lord, I accept you into my heart, as my Lord and Savior, we are indirectly saying, I want to give up my rights and I want to follow you, Lord Jesus. That I will surrender and I will pick up my own cross and I will follow you every day. It's very difficult, is it not, to carry, on or carry our own cross. Because sometimes it means uh, really Letting go of our ego. Letting go of our pride. Doing things that we don't want to do. Getting into conflicts that we rather not want to face. And these are the things uh, that we must do. As, fa as, a, as a parent, um, as professionals, there are things that we need to do, which is to make the decisions that is right in the eyes of the Lord. It may delay our promotion at work, but if we choose to do what is right, I think God's blessings will be greater than just the promotion that is waiting for us. And that is what we need to teach our children as well. And it's so hard these days because they have everything, especially living here in, in the Silicon Valley. I look at my son and it seems like to him money solves everything, right? No, he, doesn't, he doesn't want a lot of things, but things that he, uh, he is focused on is right now he likes uh, Nintendo Switch. So he knows how to, you know, work me, I guess. Dad, come here. Let me massage you. <laughs> Let me, uh, let me talk to you. I said, 
And I, I know by now his tactics, right? What do you want now, Evan? He said, it would be great if I, you know, get this or that. And I, I'm still trying to learn how to be a better father or a parent so that he weans off on me as well as his dependence on money and, and grow his dependence on, on God himself. I have to continue to teach him that material things will not give him joy. It may give him temporary you know, happiness, but those things come and go. But when we are deep in relationship with the Lord, our joy, true joy that comes, will continue to spring up. Just like how Moses actually hit the rock when they were wandering the wilderness. That water sprang up from the rock and fed all the people of Israel. We need to pray for that. We need to uh, teach ourselves and also our children that. So then the responsibility for us is not only to live for ourselves, to honor God, but that includes sharing Jesus Christ in us to the people around us. So the next uh, slides that which I will share with you are um, reports of what I have been doing. Uh, so if, if I may ask you, can you turn to the pictures? Okay. I'm sorry if it's in uh, Korean, but uh, the Guiding Light Project Ministry, if you don't know, uh, we call it short GLP, Guiding Light Project. And uh, now we are in the sixth year of this ministry, which God has started. And I'm so grateful to have uh, prayer partners uh, from the Cornerstone. And what, what we do is to reach out to the community, especially the first generation uh, immigrants. So first generation immigrants, as I am a first generation immigrant myself, uh, there are difficulties because parents, they have to go uh, get a job and, and feed the family. Uh, so sometimes they neglect their children uh, and they are not able to help them academically uh, as they want. Maybe back home they were not taught or well educated. So uh, one way for us, as I was praying for this ministry back in 2013 that God gave uh, uh, wisdom is to, uh, to start an, an after school homework club. So with that, uh, I started the outreach program first. And then from then on, uh, church sprang up. But the way that, uh, that GLP actually shares the gospel message is through twofold actually, but it comes in the form of communication, right? So we know the, the, the 8 to 2 rule, right? When it comes to communication, 80% uh, of how we communicate is nonverbal. And only 20% of how we communicate is through how we speak. Right. So what is uh, involved in non-verbal language? How we carry ourselves as well as what we do. And that's why it is so important that our faith matches our lifestyle. Because people look at us and they see how we live as opposed to what we say. Our kids do that. My kids do that all the time. I tell them this and they say, no daddy, you don't do that yourself. <laughs> I said, you're right. I need to change myself. So, the way that I uh, have been sharing the gospel message is through good works and also building goodwill in the community. So, we provide homework help uh, for those kids who need help. And most of them come from uh, Vietnamese families or, or Hispanic families. And uh, their religion, religion background is... A Vietnamese is usually Buddhist, and Hispanic is usually uh, Catholic, but some do not practice at all. So, my job and my ministry, I guess, target audience is children. 
And God has been good because He not only brought enough children, but also He brings continuously uh, enough volunteers for us to work because I cannot do this on my own. I have to recruit volunteers and these are the volunteers that are from uh, close by school in Valley Christian and also uh, around the uh, San Jose area. They, mostly high school students, they come and they give time to help others. And that's what I want to teach my kids and also uh, youth who are growing up as well as challenge parents as well. Because we should not just live an enclosed or exclusive life. That is not how God or Jesus taught us. He wants us to be exposed to the community. Go out and share the gospel message. People will not come to us. We have to go to them with the gospel message. That's why Jesus came to us. Because we live in sin and we choose not to go to where the light is. So light had to come to us. And for and this is uh, the picture which we will uh, begin in July. July we do one of the bigger projects of the year and that is the summer camp. So summer camp is a way for us to uh, recruit a lot of kids from the the community and it is a camp that studies so it's uh, it's an extension of the homework club and a lot of the kids who come to us uh, their financial situation uh, is not good where you know they can go to other camps so we provide a really low cost because we only charge them uh, cost of the books or the workbooks that they use but it is a way for me to build relationship because an effective evangelism or missions work is to build a good relationship with the people that you want to share your uh, message with. So for many of these kids, typically 60, 70 kids who come to us uh, twice a year, they are exposed to the gospel message because our church worship is on Thursday evening and the two weeks uh, summer camp includes that worship, but I make it voluntary, meaning if they want to go home during that time, that's okay. I don't make it mandatory because God does not twist our arm, right? You better believe me or else. And it's in the same way, I believe that gospel message should be preached uh, with any uh, opportunity that we can make. Whether there is an opportunity or not, our heart's attitude should be that I want to reflect Christ in me to them. It can come uh, through a help uh, with homework because there are conversations that happen and also uh, I pray for them. Whether they listen to it or not, oftentimes they talk uh, as I pray for snack during the homework club, but that's okay. I pray anyways. Because my hope is that maybe today is not the day that they open up their hearts, but maybe down, down the line where they are uh, older, that they don't come to Homer Club, but some way, somehow, God brings back the memory of this guy named Pastor Peter, how he prayed for them. And if God can use that memory for them to open up their hearts to the gospel message, and I am, you know, more than happy because I've been used by God. As Christians, we have to seek that opportunity. God, please use me today. Today to bring honor and glory to your name. In the ways and in the people that I meet, please bless the relationships. The same blessing that God promised to Moses. Abraham, I'm sorry, wherever you go, I will bless the relationships. We need to pray, not only the relationships within our own family, but also relationships that we will start or we will continue to maintain around us. So, um, one thing that I actually do caution myself is this, because of, um, of the, the types of need that they, they have, uh, a lot of times, they think their problems can be solved through money. Because they're in financial uh, uh, strains, so 
Sometimes they need extra food. Sometimes they need this and they need that. And I want to help, but I don't always want to support, help them financially. Why? Because I don't want to become their God. I don't want to solve all their problems. God should be the one that they depend on so that they can experience how God works in their life. So, a lot of ways, I, I use an analogy. I taught my two kids how to ride bicycle. Uh, and um, for the parents, we all have that experience, right? At the beginning, they are wobbly, right? So, at the beginning, we are right behind them. I'm running right behind my kids. And it, at, at any sign of them leaning over, I catch them. And then I correct them so that they can go on more. But if I did it all the time, they'll never learn. So at some point I have to let, let go of them and have them fall down and have them learn from their mistakes. And I don't mean to say I have greater faith than them or any of us here, but sometimes that's what we need. We need to fail so that we learn from our mistakes so that God who heals us, repairs us, we experience Him so that our faith grows. Our faith needs to grow. And only way for us to grow is through falling down, getting back up, doing it again. So, in closing, I want to share this uh, story which I heard of on the radio while I was in Korea with you. So there's, a, there's this man who was um, on the, uh, the beach and he was uh, getting water onto the rock. So this guy was walking by, he saw what was happening, he got curious and he went closer. And turns out this man was actually dousing water onto a starfish that was clinging to the rock. And he asked him, what are you doing? Well, as you can see, I am uh, trying to help this starfish from drying up, right? Because there was no more water. It was the, the low tide. And the man asked the man who was doing this, you know, there are so many starfish in the ocean, you know, why do you need to worry about that? And why are you spending your time? And he says, yes, that's right. There are many starfish in the ocean. But this starfish, his problem is life or death. So without my help, he will not survive. And that really struck my heart because there are many people in this world, right? We are just one in billions. But God came for a person like me. And he sent his son Jesus Christ because he saw that one soul was important enough. And we have to employ the same mindset, I see. Where we see the people, we don't just look at them as their outward appearance. Oh, he's from India, or he's from China, or you know, he lives in a, a bad neighborhood. There is much more than that. To God. Because to God it is about this is the person that is not yet received the gospel message or have not heard the gospel message. And as Jesus saw us, he saw us people with compassionate hearts. And I think that's what God is asking us to do, is to employ the compassion in our heart as we look at the people around us. Maybe there is one particular person that God's uh, putting in our heart. That may be the starfish that we need to continue to bless with God's love and His message of good news. I don't know who that is, but if that person is popping up in your mind, we need to pray and ask God's intervention so that we can be used by Him.
That's how God's kingdom grows. Amen? That's how we know that we are blessed and God is working through us. Because as Christians, we need to grow, and not only grow, we need to experience God's work, right, in us. It's not about just chasing after the worldly success, but it is about building God's kingdom through His blessings, which is upon us. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you so much for today's message.